All right, so we are recording here at World Fantasy Con 2014. Uh, this is Warren Buff, and I'm talking to Joe Saclari. And we wanted to get into some of the stories about MagicCon. Uh, I think particularly the mini golf course uh, was one we wanted to cover. And we'll see where it goes from there. Okay. Um, this is Joe Saclari. The miniature golf course was... Um, a bit of an oddball item for a Worldcon. Uh, at least we thought so at the time. And uh, it started off because we were looking uh, at our exhibit space and realized that no matter how much we filled with normal exhibits, we were still going to have probably 100,000 square feet in the room that we hadn't filled. So what kinds of things can make uh, fill a room like that? Gary Felbaum says that he was the um, inspiration for this, but actually um, part of it was done because he kept thinking that we couldn't make it, uh, make it work under our 501c3 educational uh, auspices for the IRS. And um, that was because you know, it's just a fun little thing. So it was our uh, desire to try to come up with something that would both, well, confound his argument and have fun and do something educational. Um, my wife, Edie Stern, and Mark Olson took particular glee in trying to come up with different ways of putting this thing together. And um, I had a very small part, all I did was come up with the educational justification. And what we did is we happened to know that our guests of honor, uh, Walt Willis and his wife, Madeline, were avid golfers. Um, little did we realize that um, really good golfers in Ireland really disdain miniature golf. They think it's uh, maybe in a bit of an abomination. But, um, and they were very surprised, let's say nonplussed, when we had, when we told them that we were doing the golf course in his honor. And the way we were making it educational is that one of Walt's major pieces, uh, something he did with Bob Shaw back in the 50s, was the Enchanted Duplicator, which is a story of Joe Fan going from um, Mundania and reaching the Tower of True Fandom. Uh, it's a uh, Pilgrim's Progress type of thing, if you want, done in a humorous and very fanish manner. Um, so we came up with the idea of it's miniature golf because they like golf, despite everything I said already <laughs> about that part. And that each hole was be a discrete chapter and step in the Enchanted Duplicator. So we would put either a summary or the chapter at the beginning of each hole and tell people they should read it to understand it. Then they could play through. But to compound that, to make it uh, a little bit more interesting, and the fact that building a golf course is a lot of work, um, came up with the idea, I think this was Edie's idea, um, to play Tom Sawyer. Um, you know, you've got a, a fence you need to whitewash, you've got a golf course you need to build, get other people to do it. <laughs> and so we got one or two groups, and since this was um, Mark Olson uh, was uh, very active in NESFA, NESFA agreed to do one of the holes. And we used that to get another club to do it, and then we'd use that to get a bid to do it, then we used the one bid to get a competing bid to do another hole, and it snowballed. And each one, uh, to give them a little bit of advertising, they not only had to do the hole, they could design it so that it would um, promote their bid or their convention or whatever. Um, and it turned out it worked out just fine. Um, the South Florida group decide, uh, agreed to do the last hole, the Tower of True Fandom, which it turns out was probably a big mistake. 
we were doing uh, building the Tower of True Fandom on the pretty much on the day that we should have been boarding up our houses because a hurricane was bearing down on us that destroyed a lot of South Florida. But um, we didn't actually pay much attention to that until after we finished up the tower. And uh, it was a, a, a bit of an oddball item. Um, one of the more memorable um, holes was done by uh, the Glasgow uh, bid or actually at that point, yes, it was still a bit, I guess. Uh, and they kept changing their hole because the obstacles in the hole were bottles of scotch. <clears throat> and as they used up bottles of scotch at their party every night, the hole got bigger and more complex. <laughs> so we're sitting there, and the more you could drink, the more difficult the hole the next day would be. And after four or five days of partying, that hole had a lot of uh, bottles. <laughs> the um, uh, also one really oddball item happened as we were putting this thing together. Um, we needed a small old style mimeograph, a crank mimeograph to uh, put on the Tower of True Fandom, and something very strange happened. Uh, Lee Hoffman is the person I called to ask if she still had one of her old mimeographs. And when I asked her that, there was dead silence on the other side for much longer than there should have been. And she said, yes, it came back to me. And I, you know, it was dead silence on my end there for a, a minute or so. And I said, what do you mean came back to you? Five years before, approximately, she had um, had to move from her house into her uh, parents' house to help uh, her father. And she had thrown out a whole bunch of trash, including the mimeograph. Well, the mimeograph ended up staying in the people's home because they knew she really must not have wanted to throw the mimeograph away with all the trash. So they kept it intending to give it back to her. They were moving out of town. Uh, after these five years, and she um, had thought it was gone completely, but it turned up that they, as they were leaving, they still had the mimeograph. They dropped it off in the middle of the night on her doorstep, and three days later, I called her asking about the mimeograph. So it came home to roost at the very time it was needed. Um, if you add that into the history that Lee Hoffman is a bit of a legendary uh, fanzine fan, perfect example of a, a true fan who uh, did fanzines. And the, also the previous history of that publication was that it belonged to Bob Silverberg while he was doing his fanzines. And he had given it to Lee at around 1954-55. So we had two old-time fanzine fans uh, who were also eventually professional writers, and a mimeograph that returns after five years, um, that has to be, you know, an enchanted duplicator, and it had to sit on top of the tower. And we cleaned the thing up, we picked it up from her, and we used it. There is one little anecdote after that. Bob Silverberg was looking at the golf course, and he wandered over by the uh, Tower of Enchanted Duplicator in the exhibit. And I was ha just happened to be walking across the hall when I saw him standing there looking at this with a speculative look on his face. And as he was looking at it, I don't know if he recognized it or it gave him a fanish thrill or whatever, to see an old mimeograph such as he used. But he stood there looking at it and then walked closer and closer until he recognized it as his mimeograph that he had given away, um, let's see, from 1954 to 1992. So, we're, you know, that's almost, four, it was, what is that, 38 years. 38 years he suddenly uh, came back to look at it. And um, he had to reach out and touch that old Finnish icon. Uh, so, 
Even Bob Silverberg has vanished at heart. But most of us knew that anyway. Well, that's the story about the uh, golf course and the Enchanted Duplicate. Did I leave anything out, Edie? One small correction. They weren't moving out of town. They were getting divorced. Oh, well, they were moving out of town while they, after they got divorced, I guess. Okay. All right. Uh, if you want, we can continue. We've got a... Let's see. Actually, it doesn't say how long this recording is so far, but it can't be more than 15. Oh, yes, it does. 10 minutes. So, okay. What other things you could talk about how... Is it paused? No, it's not paused at the moment. Oh, okay. You can tell the story of how our keynote speaker had to oh. commandeer an airplane. Yeah, a couple other anecdotes, I guess. Um, actually, you should probably talk about that one. We had it because well, we... Come over here so... Can, oh, it'll pick her up from there. Because oh. we were um, so close to Cape Kennedy, we were very fortunate in getting an astronaut to keynote our conference, our convention, and it was John Young. And uh, he uh, was in the position of authority at NASA at that time. Yeah, he was uh, supervising um, uh, the astronauts uh, in their various programs that they were doing uh, in Houston, I believe. Yeah. So he was planning to take a, a, a commercial jet, I think, to, to the convention. We had a luncheon planned with, a, a, I don't know, 500 attendees, something like that, as well as a speech he was supposed to give, but he missed his flight. And we were um, kind of horrified about that. Uh, but then the word came that everything would be okay. He commandeered a plane and flew himself to Florida to do the keynote speech. And it didn't, it's not as... Uh, wasteful as it sounds, he needed to get his requisite hours of flying in. So it was a, a legitimate flight. He just managed to uh, ensure that he got there in time to do our keynote. Flew in special uh, to do it. And, uh, and that, was a lot of, uh, that was a lot of fun as well. Now, one of the other things that we had um, uh, that was related to the space program was uh, making the Hugo Award. Oh, we thing. had uh, some idea of making the Hugo Award with some kind of, since we were again so close to the Space Center, with some kind of piece of, um, well, if you want, space junk. And um, I contacted one of the collectors and said, can we get materials from one of the launch pads? And he said, well, how much do you need? And I told them we we're probably going to have whatever it was, 15, 18, Hugo Awards. We needed to have something small that we could put together. Uh, a fan was doing um, the base, Phil Tortorisi was doing a base that um, with some minor twerks was supposed to sort of give a, an idea of the rocket being against a spacescape that was going off into infinity. But we'd like to have something that would ground it and tie it in with the space program itself. And he thought about it and he came back and he found some materials that were actually used in the uh, launching of the first successful uh, rocket uh, that we did not have explode uh, from the launch pad uh, at the Space Center. And it's just a small little grid from the, uh, the platform, but every single one of the Hugo Awards has that underneath the rocket. It's actually flying off or sitting on a piece of real gantry. And we have a little certificate on the back from him uh, and uh, signed by him and myself explaining what this uh, piece is. It makes it hell to dust. <laughs> but it. Um, but when Phil Tortorisi looked at it, he said, you don't want to dust this anyway. He said, this is made out of a hard um, type of resin. Just turn a hose on it. <laughs> uh, so it was, at the time, it was probably the heaviest and most solid um, uh, Yugo rocket made. Uh, since far surpassed by the one that was in Lone Star Con that was done by Vincent Villafranca. But it was um, just one of those things. We tried to do a few little extras, and that was one, I guess you could call it, one silly that worked. It wasn't silly at all. Tell about the time capsule and the responses that you got. Oh, okay. At the end of the convention, um, and this was an idea that almost got out of hand, but 
uh, and it came from Steve Whitmore, uh, that we would finish the convention and we'd create a little bit of a time capsule. We'd put material, um, since we were the 50th Worldcon, we'd create a time capsule, we'd put stuff in from the convention. At closing ceremonies, um, that was going to be my part of the closing ceremonies, I'm sitting there thanking people and saying, we're going to create this, and um, somehow mentioned that you know, we're putting this material in, and if somebody had something specific that they would like to put in, and some people came um, and brought a couple of little items. One person brought a book, uh, another one brought a picture, and then one guy came running down uh, the aisle. He reached into his wallet. He had an obituary that he had kept in his wallet uh, for Robert Heinlein, and he said, this is my favorite writer. I've had this. I've not parted with it. I'd like to put that in. When he said that, suddenly it was like a waterfall was unleashed. People started bringing material down to put in the time capsule. So the time capsule is a big plastic uh, crate, actually, and it's filled with all the little uh, items that people uh, brought. It's filled with items from the convention, but it's also filled with items that people, uh, some of the things people treasured and had with them, uh, and various uh, fanish and science fiction items, well, from 1992. Um, we're hoping to um, open that maybe after 25 years, uh, which would be soon, uh, and uh, maybe we can use it as part of a display uh, or some kind of added to a, some kind of a, cemetery, uh, a ceremony at, uh, at a Worldcon. Uh, it was uh, fun, and actually it turned out to be a bit of a touching thing. It went so far and was started to go on so long um, that Edie had to start waving at me to, hey, it's, it's going to, it's taking too long. But um, people didn't want to stop. They kept bringing things down. Um, and so uh, I think that was successful at the time. Let's hope that when we do open it, its um, success has not turned into um, a case full of stuff that we don't want to look at. <laughs> but I don't think it will. And uh, from that convention, along those lines, uh, the group you organized to run it, you've now taken up archival work to yes. a large degree, right? Yes. Um, I was always interested in, uh, in fan history uh, since I pretty much got into fandom um, because of a woman who... Uh, found out I liked fan scenes and said she could send me some and then sent me 17 cartons worth and I started getting buried in them and uh, started realizing that there was quite a history with this and so um, as we were doing things we did our, all our pass along funds and we made uh, some, do uh, some donations and then we decided that uh, FANAC Incorporated would become uh, an organization to uh, archive and promote uh, some fan history. And uh, we've set up a website, which is fanact.org, for which has, um, well, hundreds of fanzines, literally thousands of photos from conventions, clubs, and uh, other fanish type uh, activities, and uh, quite a bit of other things. Something like about fourteen to 18,000 pages, uh, web pages. In addition to that, uh, Fanact sponsors uh, Fancyclopedia 3. Uh, which is a wiki to uh, supplement the first two fan encyclopedias, one of which was done in 1943-44 uh, um, by uh, Jack Spear and was about 100 pages. In 1959, Dick Eney um, did a revision, which was like 250 to 300 pages. Uh, really depends on how many pages you count because he also took out parts and um, issued as a separate publication. And uh, currently, uh, we have gone over 10,000 pages. Now, these are web pages, so they're, each item is a separate, uh, a separate page. But we're at about 10,000 pages plus uh, on Fancyclopedia 3, which uh, Mark Olson is the chief uh, editor on. And uh, it 
both of these sites uh, are growing constantly. We're putting lots of uh, old fanzines up and uh, intending to do as many as we can. Right, and ultimately this recording is destined for fanact.org. We hope so. Uh, you've done a few others, and uh, we're hoping to uh, keep putting them up and having them uh, there for people to listen to some of the anecdotes or uh, historical things of some of the people you've been uh, doing. We're also uh, trying to work on putting some video up. Uh, we're getting permissions for some of the things that we've uh, done and that other people have done to um, uh, make it, uh, uh, you know, even uh, more pertinent uh, to newer people. And one of the other things I've been doing with these is uh, Michael Pedersen, uh, who runs Nth Degree, we've been making transcripts of them and then condensing them down into a more narrative article. Oh, great. Uh, you know, usually cutting out some of these little bits that I'm interspersing. And it's just one more way to... Uh, well, we'd be glad to put those up there. there and so people can have an, you know, bring one down, uh, copy it, uh, or read it while they're listening. Right, and we've been linking back to the uh, audio files on fanact.org. Great. And so, if there's anything else that uh, uh, you want to do, we'll be glad to keep doing these because uh, that's how you keep track of some of the fanner stuff. Um, it's particularly interesting, I find, in talking with people when you listen to two or three or four people tell you stories about the same item. Um, there is a Japanese movie which name is uh, Rashomon. Rashomon, that's it. Um, that is a perfect example. There are uh, stories about uh, some fanish things that are, well, sometimes controversial, but usually more often humorous because everybody has got a, a different story to tell. Um, the uh, one of the world cons in San Francisco, uh, everybody's got something to tell about it, and uh, from riots in the streets to uh, jumping out the windows uh, through. Um, Construction, yes, uh, and going through construction tubes where they're throwing you know, and going into the dumpster, uh, and uh, it's uh, got some of the funniest stories, and some of the some of them are a little bit horrifying, like people passing out during the banquet. I was uh, I was reading the a story from that convention recently. Uh, mm -hmm. I found the transcript of Mike Resnick's guest of honor speech from 2012, and he had a lot of stories about that. Stories about that. Um, Jack Haldeman had some stories about that. Possibly the best thing that personifies it, although not necessarily um, a uh, describes the convention itself, is a fan article that Ginger Buchanan uh, wrote. It's called "I Have." I have no... I've well, had no sleep and, and I, I must, must giggle. giggle. That's it. You've got it. I, I, so I gather you've already read that one. It, uh, it took me a little work to, to find it. Ultimately, uh, I had someone put me in touch with her and she found scans of it. Okay. Uh, it actually should be on Fanac. Um, I uh, reprinted it um, back in the 70s and it's, um, it is one of those things. It's a great piece of fan writing and it was a lot of fun. To, to read at the time uh, because I was reading other trip reports at the time which included uh, some people complaining but hers was well I guess you could call it a complaint but it is done in such a fun manner that nobody could really be offended by it yeah, we got a little bit off track but oh no that's fine we're that's kind of the the fun thing about doing a document like this you can go wherever and it's what we were talking about rather than that's true this is a serious unvarnished complete and truthful history ah uh, no anecdotes um, are personal history because the person who's telling them at least believes them <laughs> Usually. whether or not they're true or not <laughs> or accurate all right but, well I, I think that's probably a good place for us to cut this off and just to verify once more, especially since Edie joined the conversation in the middle, that 
we're okay with this going online and being a piece of fanish history. No problem for me. Nor me. All right, great. Thank you.